So this video is gonna be a little bit different. I usually go pretty in-depth about a topic in a video, and I was gonna make a video on something else. But that video is going to take a lot more research. So instead, I'm going to talk real quick about unrest in these four countries. What caused them, where we currently are, and how they're similar. Obviously, by talking about them in such a brief fashion, I won't be able to get too deep into it. So think of this video as a brief introduction instead of a deep dive like I usually do. I'm going to cover each country separately. Then, at the end, maybe we'll see a pattern emerging out of these unrest. And maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to discern the shape of things to come. Sounds good? Let's start with... The unrest in Chile began on 7th October, a week before the government decided to increase public transportation fare. As a response, students began dodging fares as a form of protest. You might have seen students jumping turnstile in a video somewhere on Twitter or YouTube, that's what that was. As time went on, more and more people, besides the students, joined in the protest. From workers to indigenous groups, people began their own protests, and the government reacted by unleashing violence upon them. But that's kinda odd, right? Why would a simple fare hikes cause unrest? Well, that's only the tip of the iceberg. There has been this tension bubbling beneath the surface of Chile since... Well, since democratically elected Allende was deposed by Pinochet with American help, really. But I'm not gonna get too deep into that, so if you wanna learn more, Ben Empanada has talked about it in his very first video. Instead, what's important for this video is the fact that his policies resulted in extreme inequality, one of the highest in the world even. See, you might have heard that Chile is a high-income country, which is ostensibly true. But it's only true because really rich people bias the average per capita income so much. I mean, the minimum wage for Chileans is about $400 a month, comparable to that of Brazil, but with one of the highest living costs in Latin America. And even worse, about 25% of people actually make less than minimum wage. And even even worse, utilities and electric bills were also increased in the months preceding the protests too. Other public services aren't much better either. Public healthcare is underfunded, while the private option is available only to those with high income. Education is left to the municipal level, which resulted in underfunding due to a lack of money from the federal level. And a tiered voucher system leads to a poorly funded public education system and highly subsidized private schools for the rich. Pensions are privatized, leading to lower benefits due to high overhead costs. Hell, even water is privatized in Chile, leaving millions of people without access to running water for days at a time. So people protest and unrest follows. In turn, the government reacted with impunity. And so far, 18 people have been killed at the time of writing. And it seems like the government is still escalating the violence, especially against indigenous Mapuche people. Now you can see why people are pissed, right? Costs of living increase, yet people's wages stagnate, while the rich gobble up a bigger and bigger portion of the wealth. In turn, the police and military beat people into submission and kill people on the streets. Sometimes that inequality and austerity are imposed by local politicians due to historical momentum, but sometimes they are imposed by supranational financial capital. With that in mind, let's take a look at... In an ironic twist, slope colossal, it would have malformed Earth's magnetic field and kill us all had it not been metaphorical, someone named Lenin turned out to be a neoliberal centrist. I am of course talking about Lenin Moreno, the current president of Ecuador. He was elected on the promise of continuing progressive policies of Ecuador's previous president, Rafael Correa. But he did not do that. See, in 2007, left-ish Rafael Correa won the presidency with promises of increasing social welfare and public services. And he did exactly that. For a time, the economy grew and people were lifted out of poverty. But this was built on the back of high commodity prices. As a developing nation, Ecuador depends heavily on commodity export to fund its social programs. And so, when commodity prices inevitably went down, the government was forced to take on debts to continue its programs. In the last years of Correa's presidency, right around the time when commodity prices went down, he tried to manage the debt by increasing inheritance tax and introducing austerity measures. It did not go well, to say the least. Protesters came out to oppose both proposed policies, and so he started a campaign of repression even against his former leftist allies. But there was still enough goodwill for him to endorse Lenin Moreno, his then vice president, with the promise of continuing social welfare and public services. Well, Lenin Moreno won that election, but none of his promises materialized. In fact, he turned around and reversed nearly all of Korea's progressive policies. So essentially, someone named Lenin turned out to be yet another neoliberal centrist, which is just, I don't know, ironic I guess. He then asked for IMF loans to pay back the debts and accepted the structural adjustment programs that come along with it. Specifically, IMF and Moreno's plan would see that fuel subsidy is abolished, fixed-term contracts for workers be accompanied with 20% pay cut, vacation days for public employees are cut by half, and, this is the most brazen one I think, the debts of big companies forgiven. That last one already happened, so you can see where Moreno's priorities actually lie. 
On top of all of that, the IMF agreement still demanded layoffs, wage cuts, and loosening labor laws. So it's not hard to see why, throughout space and time, again and again and again, structural adjustment programs have caused massive upheaval wherever they are enacted, on top of worsening people's qualities of life. And surprise surprise, that's exactly what happened in Ecuador. Indigenous people and students mobilized and protested the planned austerity. And, just like in Chile, the government reacted by unleashing violence upon the protesters. At the time of writing, eight people had been killed. The protest turned into something like a quasi-insurgency, which at one point resulted in Moreno fleeing the capital. Though, after 12 days of unrest, Moreno and indigenous leaders negotiated, and the president agreed to subsidize fuel again, while the rest of the austerity plan will still go through. So, the situation in Ecuador seems to be stabilizing, and it's a partial victory for the people. Was that the best they could get, though? This is another pattern that keeps repeating over and over again. Financial capital, through the IMF or the World Bank or other powerful financial institutions, will try to exert its power to secure their holdings in developing countries. When shit hits the fan, as they always do, it is always the people who would need to bow down before capital. Austerity measures then follow, along with the immiseration of workers under the guise of making the economy more competitive. But really, whose interests do these policies really serve? Who truly benefits from this? Well, if you dig a little deeper, you would find one common denominator among these cases. With that in mind, let's talk about American imperialism and... In Baghdad and other provinces, protests erupted at the beginning of October over high youth unemployment, poor or non-existent basic services, and government corruption. The demonstrations were spontaneous, largely peaceful, and without the backing of political factions vying for power. These are unlike other demonstrations in the past, which were usually mobilized through and led by political factions controlled by the ruling class. Instead, the current protests were organized by coordination committees, composed of academics, university graduates, youth movements, and tribal leaders. And again, like the other countries we've talked about so far, the government reacted by deploying armed forces against the protesters. What's different in Iraq is that the violence used by the state is much, much more severe than in other countries. So far, 114 people have been killed at the time of riding, mostly protesters, mostly shot in the chest or head. And they weren't stray bullets hitting protesters either. The Iraqi government has snipers killing demonstrators from afar. Though, to say it's the Iraqi government is not exactly correct either. It's more like the arm wing of political factions trying to hold on to their power. See, when the US restructured the Iraqi government after the invasion of Iraq, they essentially copy-pasted the American form of democracy into Iraqi society. And so, just like the US, an elite class of politicians emerged from the metaphorical rubble of Saddam's government. But there were many factions vying for control of Iraq's vast amount of oil, and it created a system of factional patronage where whoever controls the oil money will then turn around and use that money to buy the support of people in their faction. And so, that money isn't really being used to rebuild the country, but instead only shared among certain factions currently in power usually supported by America or sometimes even Iran. So that's why the Iraqi people are losing faith in their government. I mean, you would be too, right? It's a government that represents only a small fraction of the people. Even worse, both Iran and the US are using Iraq as a proxy to fight one another, further destabilizing a country already torn by almost two decades of war. Of course, rebuilding wouldn't be necessary in the first place if the country wasn't bombed into oblivion. The US spent an ungodly amount of money on bombs alone, which were dropped on major infrastructures during the shock and awe campaign in the opening salvo of the Iraq war. And remember, it's a war that was based on lies made up by warmongering neoconservatives trying to secure the hegemony of the American empire. The thing though, sometimes America doesn't even need a war to dig its claws into a country. Sometimes it just needs to wait until a natural disaster happens, which is exactly what happened in... The American imperial ambition in Haiti did not start in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake. From installing the Duvalier dictatorship in 1957, to CIA-backed coup in 1991, to exiling democratically elected President Aristide in 2004, the US has been intervening in Haitian politics for a very long time. But the earthquake provided a way to strengthen the American grip on the country. If you don't remember or didn't know, a magnitude 7 earthquake struck Haiti in 2010 killing up to 300,000 people and displacing millions. The destruction caused by the earthquake was immense, but for the purpose of this video, I'm going to focus instead on the recovery effort. See, in the aftermath of the earthquake, the American military swooped in and took control of everything, including the aid money pouring in from all over the world. But that money ended up only being invested in organizations and corporations that supported American interests, effectively implementing neoliberal economic policies and ceding long-term control of the economy to American businesses. 
But more than just economic control, the earthquake also ensured American political control of the country. See, even before the earthquake, there was a UN peacekeeping mission in Haiti called MINUSTA, which is French for United Nations Stabilization Mission in Haiti. And after the earthquake, it became an essential security apparatus in the country. But instead of being a neutral party, MINUSTA itself actually undermined democracy by suppressing the left populist Femmila Vallas party, the same party led by democratically elected Jean Baptiste Aristide, who was forced out in 2004. So you can guess whose interests MINUSTA served, right? So that brings us to the current unrest in Haiti. Originally, like in Ecuador, the announcement that the government will end fuel subsidies sparked the protests, but the focus then shifted to corruption allegations against the current president, Jovenel Moise, after a report came out detailing how he, and the previous three governments, embezzled $2 billion from an oil deal with Venezuela. That money was supposed to be used to develop the country, but was instead pocketed by a small ruling class of elites. See, while Haiti is nominally a democracy, Moise's election was anything but democratic. Only 18% of people actually voted during the last election, which is one of the lowest in the world. So you want to guess how he's still in power even without popular support? If you guess because he gets support from the US, then congratulations, you're seeing the pattern. And in return, beside the economic control of Haiti, America gets a partner in fighting Venezuela's Maduro government in the Organization of American States. And so, just like in Iraq, we have unrest triggered by an undemocratic government, a decaying or non-existent infrastructure, and a strictly hierarchical system where the elites control most of the wealth and power as the people languish in poverty. And, as government always seemed to do, they reacted with impunity, dishing out violence left and right, in which nine people have been killed at the time of writing. Their demands are similar too. They want the current leader to get the fuck out and let people have a voice in running the country. Sounds familiar, no? So at this point, you've probably figured out the pattern, right? It always starts with past American intervention. It happened in Chile with Pinochet. It happened in Ecuador twice with CIA-backed coups. It happened in Iraq very recently. And it happened in Haiti with the Duvalier dynasty. Then, labor movements were crushed, replaced by harsh neoliberal policies of lax labor laws, deregulation, and acceleration of resource exploitation. These neoliberal policies decimated social welfare programs, public service funding, and infrastructure investment. These policies also created a hierarchical society with a class of powerful ruling elite controlling wealth and power. If social welfare exists, debts will eventually force the government to scale back or even abolish those programs. After a while, people will get sick and tired of that shit, and unrest will begin. In the past, oh, I don't know, 40 to 50 years, this cycle has been coming on and off, usually mirroring the cycle of long-term debt. What I think is changing is the scale of it all, mostly because the world's population has grown and inequality is at its highest since the 1960s. And this is literally happening all over the world. And, more importantly, I think, will begin to happen in more and more places as the cycle of debt enters its deleveraging phase. The question then, when this thing shakes the foundation of the current global capitalist order, which way will it bend towards? When a liberal democratic system, no matter how superficial it is, starts failing, it will usually go to either fascism or socialism. Now, I don't know about you, but I know which one I prefer. It's socialism, by the way. I hope I don't have to make that obvious. And oh, by the way, if I'm missing other unrest in countries like Lebanon, Catalonia, Indonesia, and so on and so on, it's because I only had a week to make this, so give me a break, alright? You might also be wondering why I'm not including the big protest. You know, the one the media really seems to love so much? The one in East Asia? The one involving video game and tech companies? Well, you gotta wait for that one, because that topic will be rolled into next month's video. So stay tuned for that. That one is special, because I think it will be a sort of barometer of the things to come, if you will. You'll, you'll see.